The 18-year-old smirked at the camera as she stood up and walked to the defense table this afternoon, her arms and legs shackled. After the judge read the complaint against her, she looked over, stared at the camera, and motioned to the area under each of her eyes with her index finger. Isabella Guzman, smiling for the cameras after stabbing her mom 79 times. Now she says she is ready to return to society. Hi friends and welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Crime Corner with Jen and for those of you who don't know, my name is Jen and I talk about true crime cases on this channel. Before we jump into today's case, if you guys like my content, please be sure to like, subscribe, and to turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. In this week's video, we're going to be talking about a pretty troubled and disturbed teen who ends up becoming a TikTok sensation. This is the case of Isabella Guzman. Isabella Guzman was born on June 1st, 1995 in Colorado, USA. She was born to Robert and Yunmi Guzman. However, her parents would end up divorcing while Isabella was still a child and her mother, Yunmi, would go on to marry or remarry a man by the name of Ryan Hoy. Also, I think it's good to note here that Isabella's dad is Hispanic while her mother is Asian, so that does make her a mixed-race child. I did see a few comments online confused about why Yunmi was Asian, but yet Isabella looked very Caucasian or more Hispanic, and that is the reason why. According to several reports, after Isabella's parents' divorce, Isabella would live with her mother and stepfather for several years. Unfortunately, because there was just a lot of tension between Isabella and her mother, apparently Isabella had a lot of behavioral issues, even from such a young age, and her mother just couldn't really deal with it. So because of this, they would end up having Isabella go and live with her biological father at the age of seven. According to Isabella's biological father, Robert, he states that while Isabella did have a number of behavioral issues, she was overall a good-hearted and sweet girl who loves nature and animals. However, he does acknowledge that his daughter had difficulties when it came to respecting elders, authorities, and her parents. As Isabella transitioned into her teenage years, she would eventually make the move back into her mother and stepfather's home. However, this was a terrible idea because the two just really continued to struggle with their relationship. And when I say the two, I do mean Yunmi and Isabella. At one point, Isabella ends up dropping out of high school, so she never finishes her schooling, and she gets herself mixed up in a pretty bad crowd. This obviously leads to a lot more issues and a lot more tension between Isabella and her mother. And in August of 2013, it's reported that their relationship just deteriorated beyond repair. Ryan, who's Isabella's stepfather, stated that Isabella had grown to become more threatening and more disrespectful towards her mother. So much so that it just began to make everyone feel very uncomfortable. Around this time period, Yunmi and Ryan would start hearing from their neighbors that in the middle of the night at just odd hours, they would spot strange men jumping over their fence and into their backyard and entering their home. In fact, the neighbors would even call 911 on a number of occasions because they were fearing for the family's life. They assumed that these strange men were just breaking into Ryan and Yunmi's home. However, that wasn't the case. It would turn out that these men, these strange men who would hop over their fence in the late hours of the night, were men that Isabella had been seeing and they were coming to pay her a visit. Now, I do want to quickly state here that I have read some reports that after Isabella had dropped out of high school, she allegedly became involved in drug and prostitution. So I do wonder whether these men were really her boyfriends or guys that she was casually dating or if they were perhaps her clients. The only reason I even thought of that is because I have read some articles and seen some comments that have indicated that this may be the case. Although I do also want to clarify that I cannot confirm that. It's just stuff that I've read online. However, what I will say is that if they were indeed her clients, then it's pretty messed up of her to be running such a business inside of her parents' home. 
Needless to say, with all of this happening and with all the issues that Isabella was no doubt creating inside of you and me and Ryan's home, there was just a lot of arguments and fights constantly happening between you and me and Isabella. And on August 27th, 2013, one of these fights would escalate and would result in Isabella spitting in her mother's face. The very next day, on August 28th, Yunmi would receive an email from her daughter reading, You will pay. Apparently, according to several reports, this was not the first time Isabella has threatened her own mother. She's actually threatened to kill or to harm her mother on a number of occasions now. And just because of how escalated their fights get sometimes, Yunmi was now becoming a little bit scared of her own daughter. And honestly, I don't blame her because from what I've read, it seems like Isabella is very unpredictable and she has a really hard time regulating her emotions. I mean, their fights are pretty bad. She spat in her mother's face and she's constantly threatening to harm her mother. So I don't blame you and me for being a little bit terrified of her own child. So at this point, you and me is just really scared of her daughter because i mean again like i just said there's been repeated threats and escalated fights so at this point she's like i need some help so it's unclear to me what exactly they fought about on august 27th but whatever it was it must have been really really bad because yun mi ends up calling isabella's biological father and ends up also calling the police the police arrived to the Hoy's home and they would speak with Isabella and they would explain to her that her mother had every legal right to remove Isabella from their home if Isabella doesn't begin respecting her mother and doesn't start listening to their rules. And when Yunmi contacts Robert, she asks him to please speak some sense into their daughter because at this point, things are getting really out of hand and she needs some help because she's tired of the constant fighting and the constant threats as well. So she asks him like, hey, can you come over and just talk to her? And just hours before the crime takes place, Robert would visit Yunmi and Ryan's home and he would speak with his daughter. Robert, Yunmi, Isabella, and Ryan would all gather together in Yunmi and Ryan's backyard, and Robert would begin explaining to Isabella the importance of respecting your parents. He felt like Isabella was very open to the conversation and that she was very receptive to what he had to say to her, but unfortunately, Robert would be hugely mistaken. Just hours after the conversation with Robert and after he had left, Yun Mi and Isabella would engage in another huge altercation. Ryan was also home when this happened, but he was downstairs eating his dinner when all of a sudden he hears this loud thump coming from upstairs. You see, his wife had come home on August 28th around 9.30 p.m. And when she entered the home, she told him that she was going to go upstairs and she was going to go take a shower. And while Yun Mi was upstairs showering and just getting ready for bed, Ryan was still downstairs eating his dinner when he hears shouting going on upstairs and a huge thump. And after hearing that loud thump coming from right upstairs, he would hear his wife screaming. Ryan quickly gets up from the dining table and he starts making his way towards the stairs and he only gets to the foot of the stairs when he sees Isabella slam the door to the bathroom shut. Ryan manages to get upstairs and then he's trying to push open the bathroom door only to realize that Isabella had locked it from the inside. And then all of a sudden, he feels something wet seeping through from under the bathroom door. And when he looks down, he notices that it's blood. Ryan quickly dashes downstairs to try to find his cell phone and he manages to get it and he starts dialing 911. And while he's doing this, he also goes back up the stairs because he's trying to figure out like how can he get this door open because obviously something horrible is happening behind the other side of that door and he needs to get this open ASAP. And when he finally stops in front of that bathroom door again, he hears his wife say, Jehovah. And that is the last thing he'd hear from the other side of that bathroom door. 
Shortly after, Isabella would open the door and she would step out of the bathroom holding a bloody knife. Ryan would recount that when Isabella had opened the door and stepped out, she didn't say a single word to him. She apparently didn't even look at her stepfather. She just left the bathroom and walked straight past him down the stairs. And when Ryan would make his way into the now-opened bathroom, what he would find inside was just beyond devastating. Yoon Mi was laying on the floor uncovered. There was a baseball bat laying beside her and she was covered in stab wounds. He would try to give her CPR, but to no success because by the time he had reached her, she was already dead. 18-year-old Isabella Guzman had stabbed her mother a total of 79 times in the head, the neck, and in the torso. It would also be discovered that she had slashed her mother's throat open. This now explains why when the door was locked, there was just so much blood streaming out of the slit under the bathroom door and into their hallway. So by the time dispatchers would arrive to the Hoy's home, Isabella would be long gone. Officers would launch a manhunt for her and would inform the public that she was armed and dangerous. Luckily, the search wouldn't take long. The next day, sometime in the afternoon, officers would find Isabella hiding out in a parking garage. She was still in the same sports bra and shorts that she was wearing the night prior and she was still covered in her mother's blood. Isabella's arraignment would begin on September 5th, 2013. Now, reports have stated that on the day of her arraignment, Isabella had to be dragged out of her cell because she was just refusing to go. And when she finally arrived into that courtroom, her behavior was just so strange. And I'm sure that if you are aware of this case, you've seen the videos of her arraignment through TikTok or just social media. And yeah, they're just super, super weird. She begins making bizarre faces at the camera while sitting in the courtroom. She begins smirking and pointing at her eyes. It was so strange that the people around her inside that courtroom just weren't sure what to make of this whole situation. Now, inside of that courtroom, Isabella would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. A doctor would even come forward to testify that Isabella was suffering from schizophrenia and that she was experiencing delusions for years now. And according to Isabella, she wasn't even aware that the person she was stabbing was her mother. She was convinced that she was stabbing a woman by the name of Cecilia and that she was doing it in order to save the entire world. A DA by the name George Brockler would make the following statement to the press. We punish people who make decisions to do wrong when they knew better and they could have done something differently. In this particular case, I am convinced that this woman did not know right from wrong and she could not have acted differently than she did given the significant schizophrenia and paranoid delusions, audible, visual hallucinations that she was going through. And the judge who was presiding over this case would accept Isabella's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. And instead of prison time, she would be sent to the Colorado Mental Health Institute and would be ordered to remain there until she was no longer a danger to society. While all of this happened in 2013, in an interesting turn of events, Isabella would be surprised to find herself rising to TikTok stardom. Sometime in 2020, TikTok users began posting videos of Isabella's 2013 arraignments. And honestly, I just want to say that this society is just so whack because this woman ends up becoming a TikTok sensation despite having committed a horrible crime against her own mother. People on the internet became obsessed with Isabella. They were commenting on her looks and noting how beautiful she looked. They were intrigued by her bizarre facial expressions during her arraignments. And there were even creators putting out videos of themselves trying to mimic the exact faces that she was making in her 2013 arraignment videos. 
And the craziness doesn't stop there because people start creating fan bases online for Isabella. There are dedicated Facebook and Instagram pages for this girl. And you know what's really disturbing to me? People began making comments online about how you and me probably deserved this and that of course, because Isabella is so beautiful, that she definitely had a good reason to murder her own mother. It's incredibly shocking to me that our society can just literally romanticize anything, including murder. And they're romanticizing someone who is clearly not mentally well and who has done something incredibly just horrific and traumatic. It leaves me completely speechless to know that there are people in our society that think it's okay to romanticize any of this. Now, while she was rising to fame online, Isabella was still being held in the Mental Health Institute. She was apparently going through tons of therapy and she was receiving a lot of help in terms of the medication she needed to manage her schizophrenia. However, in November 2020, Isabella would petition the court for her release. She claimed that she was no longer a danger to society and that she was mentally well enough to return to a normal life. I was not myself when I did that, and I have since been restored to full health. Now, what's also surprising here is that Isabella would then come forward to the world or to the court and she would tell them that she had been abused by her mother and her stepfather. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I left the religion when I was 14 and the abuse at home worsened after I quit. And it was the abuse that she was suffering from that led to their tense relationship and to the tragic situation that occurred on August 28, 2013. The fight with my mom was terrible and um, I was injured in the process. I have the scars on my hands. Um, I don't know if you can see or not. As of today, 2023, Isabella still remains in the institution and has not been released. While she claims that she is mentally fit now to rejoin society, whoever is overseeing that clearly does not believe so, and I'm inclined to believe them. However, in June of 2021, the court would grant Isabella permission to leave the institution to attend her therapy sessions off the premises. Now, I am very aware that this is an incredibly controversial case. There are people out there who believe that Isabella is an absolute psychopath and that she's pure evil. They don't buy it when she says that she had no idea that she was stabbing her own mother and that she was in fact stabbing another person named Cecilia in order to save the world from doom. However, there are people who believe that she was just not mentally well at the time that the crime took place and therefore it wasn't intentional and it wasn't her fault. I think that when you take into consideration the fact that she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and that she was suffering from years of delusions, both of which were confirmed by a doctor, then it does become a really difficult thing to just look at this case and be like, oh no, she was purely just an evil monster because when mental health is involved in these types of situations it is just it's really hard to figure out how much of it is actually their fault or how much of it was just beyond their control maybe she really wasn't able to control what happened or maybe she was schizophrenic and delusional but yet had resentment towards her mother and intentionally did what she did knowing that she could just fall back on her mental health issues i don't know these are all things that I have seen online or seen being discussed online and I myself don't know where I stand on it. I also want to go back to the fact that she did bring up abuse allegations against her mother and stepfather and claimed that they had abused her in the name of religion, basically. First off, let me just clarify that none of this was confirmed. The allegations have never been confirmed, so we don't know for sure. Whether the allegations are true or not, some people believe that there's a kernel of truth in those allegations and that this could have had a huge impact on Isabella's mental health. 
And then there are people who believe that Isabella probably just was trying to say anything she could in order to get released back into society. Again, I'm not really sure what to make of it, although one thing that I do find strange about this allegation is that she's basically claiming that her parents were abusing her in the name of religion and that they were probably being very like strict and, and cruel towards her. However, from what I've read online, it really sounded like Isabella was out of control. There was no controlling Isabella. She was 18 years old, but had chosen to remain in their home. She had dropped out of school and had begun doing drugs and um, reported, allegedly, So if her parents were that controlling and abusive towards her, how was she able to do all these other things inside their home? She was running, reportedly, allegedly, a inside of her bedroom. There were men sneaking into her family's home at odd hours of the night. And if her parents were really just that mean or controlling of her, then how was she able to get away with all of this for so long? I don't know. There's just something about her story that sounds off to me, but also I don't want to sit here and say that she's lying about it because we don't know what was going on behind closed doors. However, what I do know is that I think it's a great idea to keep Isabella where she is right now. I think it's a good place for her to be. She's being watched there, she's being cared for there, and she's getting the help that she needs, which she might not be able to receive if she was back in our normal society. So those are my thoughts. Um, I would love to hear what you guys think about this case and whether or not you believe Isabella is actually guilty or not. Do you think she did this intentionally? Or do you guys think she could just be a victim to her own parents and to her mental health issues? I'd love to hear what you guys think. So I look forward to reading your comments. And thank you so much for supporting me and tuning in to this video. If you guys have any case recommendations, please be sure to drop them to truecrimebygentai at gmail.com. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you guys so much. And I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Bye.